western ports of Europe, the race to empty and turn ships around, the race to build and replace, these were the signs of a new kind of battle, the world's first battle of the Atlantic. Enough ships, enough men. In 17, a cousin of mine was a cadet in the Royal Flying Corps. He remembers Prince Albert, later to become King George VI, watching their antics at an English south coast town. There were hundreds of them sporting the white cap flashes that marked trainee pilots, and all flying crazy. The Royal Flying Corps, parent of what was one day to become the Royal Air Force. My cousin is always saying what a sausage machine the whole thing was. It had to be if German superiority were to be challenged seriously. After only a few weeks, too few, you collected your helmet and gear and declared yourself ready for anything. Anything means flying day after day in contraptions that would make many present day pilots catch their breath, let alone fly. But day after day, those contraptions were improving, becoming better armed and better powered. The air development of only a few months of that war would have needed years in peacetime. Enough men, enough machines, enough money. Yes, like everything else, it all cost a packet. And that was where the loan schemes and bond issues came in. War is the most costly business of all, yet somehow they always seem to be able to find the cash for it. But enough of everything meant too often not enough for the home front. Rationing in Britain had still to come, but there were plenty of demonstrations like this with mothers and babies up in arms over official muddles in things like milk prices and distribution. That winter, many essentials became conspicuous by their absence, and go find the coal for yourself became the maxim for many a British family. Find it and take it away. Just about then, things more like airships than cars became a common sight. You could run a car for quite a time on the coal gas that one of those bags held, as long as you didn't overfill it and take off. But for most people, getting about meant walking or cycling. Fewer buses meant using your own feet, one way or another. One thing there never seemed a shortage of, good cheer. At the shows and concerts to entertain the troops and wounded, no lack of entertainers. Admittedly, like the pilots, some of the dancers could have done with a bit more training, but enthusiasm is what really counted. There you might have seen Harry Tate giving his celebrated imitation of, yes, the Kaiser. Or perhaps it might be Hetty King and Ernie Lottinger doing some involved cross-talk act, complete with elaborate funny business. In 1917, a laugh made such a welcome escape that, well, it wasn't difficult to produce one. With such comics, even the non-surgical cases at the hospitals were kept in stitches. <clears throat> yes, if you look for it, you could always find a funny side somewhere. I recall an old friend of mine getting the shock of his life when one day he saw circus elephants helping out on a farm. Do you know he never touched a drop for months afterwards? Pulling your weight, that was the mood and spirit of 1917. And with such a spirit, you felt that the Allies couldn't fail to win, sometime or other. Of course, just as long as they had enough elephants. <laughs>